All right, thank you everybody for coming and thanks for waiting. Um, we generally wait uh, about 20 minutes to half an hour because even though we say six o'clock, it is a weeknight. And I know it's tough for a lot of people to come in and make it. So first off, thank you guys for coming. My name is Ron Chinzer. Uh, I am part of this. Uh, we have some students from Guelph Humber University that help us out. Uh, <coughs> my boss was the Asian gentleman who signed you in. Uh, the reason he sits over there is because he's not as nice to look at as me. So I get to present this to you and talk to you guys here. So first off, thank you for everybody coming. I know it's tough to come out on a weeknight. I very much appreciate it. Um, to give you a little bit of uh, background and heads up for kind of how tonight's going to go. Um, I do record a portion of this at the beginning, so I do have a microphone on and a camera, but I shut all that off. Right? The reason why we do record this is we put it up on social media. The reason we put that on social media, it's kind of a long story. We did it by accident at first. Um, but what you learn as we start talking today about what the Toronto Police is really trying to do when it comes down to gang prevention and stopping gang violence is we really need to get what's happening at the community level out to areas of the government that don't have any contacts here. So being on social media allows us to send some snippets out to different levels of government to help advocate for what's happening here. Uh, if you do notice for stuff like this, I'm not wearing a suit and tie. None of us are for the most part, except for some of the gentlemen over there. And um, that's just how they operate. Even if he's going to work out, he'd still wear a suit and tie. Uh, the reason we don't, and if you also notice that uh, the chief of police is not here, we don't have high-ranking police officers, we don't have politicians, and we don't have media here. We did that on purpose. All right, the reason we did that on purpose is the first gang prevention town hall that we did, we didn't have them there, um, and not because we thought, oh, we're not going to have the politicians and the media and the high-ranking police officers there. Uh, it's not that we didn't want them to have them there. We just said, before we bring them out, let's iron out the wrinkles, right? Let's make sure we have a figured out how we do this properly. But what happened was in that first town hall, um, the community opened up so much, and at the end of it, they very much appreciated that we didn't make this a photo opportunity for them. They really much appreciated that we actually talked to them and they had a, a clear place to be able to talk back and share what's happening on their level. And, uh, and then slowly over the course of all these town halls, I think this is our 14th one, I don't even remember how far we in, but we're pretty far in. We've changed each one from the last one based off of the feedback. And each one of these has been getting progressively better for all of us. So um, as much as this is going to be a presentation and a conversation, I really want to focus on the conversation part. But before we get to that conversation, how it's going to look for today is we're going to spend about half an hour to 40 minutes to kind of give you what we've learned about gang prevention and kind of give you an idea and the history as to how we got here. And then after that, we're going to have an open conversation. I'm going to turn off the microphone, we're going to turn off the cameras, and I hope everybody in this room can be open and honest and respectful of each other and our opinions and our experiences. The reason I bring that up is because it's so important to be respectful to each other and to be able to tell the truth. All right, the truth being the truth as it is to you. All right, if you've had an experience, if you have a, percepti a perception and an idea, you should be able to talk about it openly uh, because the idea is it's true and it happened to you, but your experiences can lie to you. And the idea is to say that that might not be the single truth for everything else, and really the solutions to the problem that we're talking about today, it's so deep that in order for us to get deeper into this, we gotta know what's happening on a depth level, right? If you look at it now, every level of government is talking about guns and gangs. We just had a federal election and all of the leaders were talking about what are you gonna do about the gun gang violence, not only in Toronto, but all over the country. And it's a topic because it's concerning because it impacts so many community members. And sometimes you'll hear the solutions, right? So what are some of the solutions that some levels of government have said about gun and gang violence? What are they talking about that you've heard? If you heard it, yes, sir. Gun registry. Gun registry. All right, and what else? If you're gun ban, right? And they're talking about jobs and all these things. And here's a problem. People think one solution is going to solve this problem. That's, that's not the case at all. So part of this for us is a massive education campaign an advocacy, advocacy campaign for the Toronto Police and for myself and my partners to come out there and advocate on behalf of how big this problem is and to stay away from dumping millions of dollars into solutions that do nothing but help get people into elected positions. The idea is we need, a, we need an actual solution and we know what the solution looks like, but we really need to have the buy-in from the community first and foremost for us to do our job. So <coughs> where this came from was <coughs> three years ago, one of our deputy chiefs, all right? And so imagine this guy is the vice president of the company. He comes down to our office in Guns and Gangs, and that's where Jason and I work out of. And he says, listen, every year for the last 15 years, we've gone out and we've done these big raids, right? And I'm sure you've seen it on TV. There's been raids in this neighborhood. 
where you'll hear of 150 people arrested and 50 search warrants and we take 30 guns off of the street. That happens every time, a couple, sorry, a couple times a year. Well, last night we were in the Western Road area and a year ago we were in that community because we did a project called Project Patton where it was uh, Toronto's largest gun seizure on one project. All right, there was uh, 75 people arrested, uh, 70 plus guns in total in the entire project over a nine month investigation taken from one gang called the Five Point Generals. Thousands of charges were laid and for three months that community didn't have one shooting. All right, and that was what we did. Well, this is what the problem is on our end of it is we do this every year, but the numbers don't change. Gangs still come, they still do what they wanna do. So while we're doing our job and we're doing our job well, where we're getting record numbers, we're not really solving the problem. So this became a problem solving question for us. So this vice president or deputy chief came down, spoke to Jay and I and he said, listen guys, we have to think bigger. And by thinking bigger, it was, what can we do to, to get a gang member out of a gang? And we have to start working on that respect. So uh, for, uh, for about two years or a year hard, a hard year, uh, Jason and I did a lot of research and we interviewed a lot of people. The very beginning, we spoke to a whole bunch of other police officers that were like us, experienced in guns and gangs. And we said, all right, this is the solution or this is the problem that we have to solve. It's how do you get a gang member out of a gang? So I'll ask you here, what would you do if you had that question? It's difficult, right? Yes, sir. Which that's the reason why you got into the gang. Ah. Each, uh, probably each, not each member, but there are multiple re different types of reasons why. And you have to address the underlying problem first, what got him in, what got him into doing antisocial behavior before you can get him out. Yeah, very, very educated answer, and that's exactly what it is. But at the beginning, when we spoke to other police officers, and we asked them how to get a gang member out of gangs, a lot of us, as well as other agencies that we spoke to, and we spoke to police services all over the world, said, what are you guys doing about this problem? And we had a couple realizations. One of them was that nowhere in the world is there a program that effectively works to get a gang member out of a gang. We looked all over Canada, we looked all over the United States, we looked at South America, and we looked at Europe. And nobody has an evidence-based strategy that works. And why we did that was, we said, why are we gonna waste our time trying to make something when we could just find something that works and just do that here? And we realized as we did that, that the problem isn't as simple as just uh, finding something and giving an alternative. It's, it's a very deep problem. The problem has depth to it. And where that depth came from was we had two other things we had to worry about. All right, and as a police organization um, and as a government organization, when we wanted to get a gang member out of a gang, there was two things that popped up outside of what do we do? And the two things that popped up is, what is a gang member and where do we go? All right. But before that, one of the things to highlight before we really started to look at the research was, well, what is a gang? So I'll ask you here, um, to you and your experiences, uh, what is a gang? Or what's the purpose of a gang? Let's go with the purpose of a gang. So what's the purpose, anybody? Yes, ma'am. For some family. Family, yeah. that right, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And there's power and all the rest of these that go, go along with that to, I guess, uh, to have loyalty. To have loyalty, yes, sir. I think it's a group of people who uh, think that they represent a certain population and are working to gain, uh, to, uh, to gain what they feel that group uh, uh, deserves. All right, so we have different things, right? But the, if we dissect what you had said uh, with a portion of yours, so not 100%, those are reasons why people might join a gang. But we have to look at specifically what is the purpose of a gang. And what we'd found was empirically, through all the research that we did and all the books from PhDs and professors and academics in the field, everywhere in the world, <laughs> this is the three things gangs always do. All right, they deal drugs, they control a territory, and they collect debt. Okay, those are the three things that every gang does. So as much as there's an emotional tie-in to say, these are the reasons why somebody might join a gang, for us, we have to be objective and look at, okay, what does a gang actually do? But gangs do many other things than just this. 
right? They do many other things, and all these other things that they do, there's some tie-in or connection to one, if not all three of these. So what are some of the other things that gang members do? They accumulate weapons. Yeah, they'll get and ammunition. Right, so they'll, they'll traffic in weapons or possess weapons. And what else do they do? What, what's been happening in the city that's on the, on the news all the time? Sex trafficking, right? They pimp, they, they find underage girls, they manipulate them, they'll traffic them for money. Yes, ma'am. So if I just ask with regards to the sex trafficking, would you find that in your region that's historically a fact for gays or is that like a newer phenomenon that's growing? Um, what I'll tell you is in some of the research it's a newer phenomenon because of uh, sometimes the internet, right? The, the ability to traffic became substantially easier when you could just do it from a cell phone as opposed to having to have a physical location. So the internet really created new avenues and new streams of crime as well as wealth. Uh, so it has expanded, but these gangs, they started off for drugs, territory, and debt, but money's part of the process, right? You, somebody else had to, something else. Human trafficking. Well, what else do we see? What, what else, what's the biggest thing that happens all the time where everybody says, man, there's, there's been too many of these a year? Shootings. And what, what's, the, what's the worst thing that can happen if somebody gets shot? Murder. Death. And are we at a stage now where there's shootings happening everywhere? At all times of the day. At all times of the day, right? And that created, when we've had these conversations, and not just these town halls, but we have presented to many different organizations, many different groups, many different government agencies. And when we have these conversations and we actually grow in depth, and we start to hear some of the feedback, um, we're starting to see things in a little bit of a different light. And I'll tell you what that little bit of a different light is, is for neighborhoods like, all right, there's no, there's no, we're just gonna say it is what it is, what is a known gang area? There's are a historical gang here, and they're one of many gangs that are in this area. Now, when the rest of the city hears of a shooting in, I want you to imagine somebody who lives in a nicer area, we'll just say a more affluent area, all right? When they hear of a shooting and they're reading it in the newspaper, what do they think to themselves sometimes? Well, it's not in my neighborhood. It's supposed to happen there. And then when shootings pop up in places that regularly aren't supposed to happen, now there's a problem. Is that fair to say? Is that a problem? Yeah, 100%. Because it's showing, it's showing a level of tolerance. Right? So these are the insights that we're gaining understanding, saying that, hey, this has always been a problem. This is not a new phenomenon. It's just now branched out because it's been tolerated and it's, the tolerance has allowed it to grow. <clears throat> so they do many different things, but all of those things are tied into that. So we kind of knew, okay, what is the activity and what are the things that we're looking for that people are doing for us to start to look at where should we start to hone in a little bit? <clears throat> and the second question became who joined gangs, all right? So I'll ask here, who joins a gang? So let's describe this, all right? And, and we, we can do this. I, I do this in every one because it's the most effective way to do it. And this is where I'm going to ask everybody to be as honest as you can be. Uh, <laughs> this is the most fun part for me. It's going to get awkward, and that's okay. All right. So I want you to imagine this. I go into my pocket. I pull out this pill, and this pill is a magic pill. All right. And we are going to use this pill to find a gang member. We're going to give this gang member this pill. They're going to take it, and instantly their life is going to change. All right. They are going to just instantly have the highest IQ, they're gonna have a business sense, they're gonna understand money, they're gonna understand economics, and they're gonna love their community. And what they're gonna do is they're going to skyrocket the economic impact of your neighborhood, they're gonna create business here, they're gonna create thousands of high income jobs, <laughs> there's gonna be a statue here, but we have an hour in this room collectively to find this person, to give them this magic pill. And we're gonna change this entire neighborhood. Okay, so we have to find this person, so Let's go with, what does this person look like? So we have an hour, so let's go with a rough age. What age do you think this gang member would be? Kindergarten. Kindergarten? Yeah, probably just for maybe eight years ago, and they showed all the parts of the city. Uh-huh. Toronto, and they had initiation as well as, like, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three. Okay, so they're being initiated, right? The recruiters, but let's, let's look at the recruiter. So who's the, who's the one doing the initiation? How old is this person? 14. 14, 18? Are you guys, oh, everybody's kind of, okay, this is, we're gonna give this magic pill, we're gonna change this person's life. 14, 18, we're good? Now what sex is this person? Is it a boy or a girl? Boy. It's a boy. Um, and um, 
uh, what kind of clothes do they wear? We have an hour. We have to give them this pill. We're going to change their life. So we got to make sure we pick the right person here. Here we're finding a gang member. Nice shoes, nice clothes. <coughs> Okay, and they got all that stuff. They were, we have a 14, 18 year old kid, boy, wearing nice clothes, Jordan's Converse, uh, Raptors gear. Uh, we're all good with that so far, right? Yes, sir. Jewelry, wearing jewelry, really good. Yes. <coughs> Sorry, the jewelry. Yeah, jewelry, right? Okay, great. All right, so we got that. <coughs> Now, now, what skin color is this kid? Black. Okay, is everybody good with that for now? They're all colors. They're all colors. But listen, guys, we have a, we have we have one pill. Now we only have half an hour. We've lost half an hour figuring out who we're going after. Okay, before we get to that, let's let's skip one more step, all right? Let's say, okay, so we kind of know what we're looking at in terms of physical description, but let's go with where should we go? So give me a part of the city where you think gang members are. We're, we're gonna, listen, we have 20 minutes now. Time is running out. We have to give this person this pill. We're going to change our life. So give me a uh, low income area, but I need an intersection. Jane and Finch. Okay, Jane and Finch. Jane and Finch. So now we know everybody's good with Jane and Finch. We're going to find a gang member. We're going to give them this pill. We're going to change our life. We're good with that. Perfect. Let's go back to the first part now. What color is the skin of this kid in Jane and Finch? Yes, sir. Okay, so it's, he says if you believe the news reports, it's black. Are we all in agreement? We're going to we have 10 minutes now. We have to give this kid this pill. We're going to change his life. He's a gang member. All right, we're good with it. Listen, we got five seconds. Four seconds, three, two, good, perfect. All right, so we got a black kid. So now I go to Jane and Finch. I find a black kid, 14 to 18 years old. He's wearing that nice clothes. He's got gold jewelry. And I force feed this pill down his throat. And I say, kid, I just saved your life. You're a gang member, and now you're going you're gonna to blow up. It's, can I do that? Can I do that? Uh, not if you want to follow the Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. Yeah, so obviously I can't force feed him a pill. But how many kids look like that in that area that aren't gang members? A lot, yep. right? So this is now our uh, 14th gang prevention town hall. And every single one of the gang prevention town halls, this has been the exact same description. The exact same. All right. And, and the point of that is, and the reason we bring it up, yes, sir. Is it accurate from your experience? You know what? Is that, is that the most common thing? <clears throat> it depends on gang? what neighborhood you're in. Okay. All right. So because so demographics do matter. No. The answer is that when we looked at gang members and we had to be objective about it, not subjective, all right? Because as we spoke to all the other police officers and all the other law enforcement agencies, our friends at community housing, <clears throat> we realized, listen, that's, we can't do that because it's not accurate. It's not accurate to do that. So we said we had to really rely on an academic lens again to figure out, well, all right, man, well, who are we looking at in terms of gang members? And what you have in front of you, you have those little cards, the laminated cards. Well, in 2007, Public Safety Canada produced this publication, which is on our website, and it's listed on there. We have it for free. We got it. And what they said is, hey, if you really want to look at it, and they looked at these PhDs and professors and academics in the field, looked all over the world, and what they found was these are the commonalities in people who become gang members, and they're called youth gang risk factors, and they apply to youth and adults. And if you look at those, there's 36 risk factors over five categories, and ultimately what happens is the more of those boxes you check off for a person, the more likely they are to become a gang member. Now, if you take a look at those risk factors, does anything there not make sense to anybody? I want you to picture, the more of these you check off, the more likely the person is to become a gang member or a criminal. All right. And now, does anything there have to do with your sex or your skin color or your ethnicity or your culture or your religious beliefs? None of it has to do with it. So thus, we have to become very clear as to who are we going after because not just in this room, but in every room we've been in, the description has been a young black kid. And while that might not be true entirely in every neighborhood, it might be true in some. 
But in other neighborhoods, it might be a Middle Eastern kid. In other neighborhoods, it might be Eastern European. And some of it might be South Asian. And the idea was we had to really advocate and redefine what we're looking at when we're thinking of a gang member. Because if we're just looking at one population, you can't do that one, and you might be creating a bigger problem than solving the problem. And the other part to that is you might be neglecting other people who really need the help. So we had a real objective way to look at how are we gonna find gang members. We looked at these risk factors, and Jason and myself, we'd spent six months, and we spoke to 2,000 frontline police officers in Toronto, and we spoke to them, we said, hey guys and girls, look at these risk factors. If in your everyday activity, you come across a kid or an adult or somebody you have a relationship with, and now that you're aware of these risk factors, if you think they're at risk of becoming a gang member or they're a gang member and they want help, if we can identify where they need help and we can get them the help that they need, let us know if you have a relationship with them. So we had done 2,000 frontline police officers and we had an overwhelming response of police officers who had already had relationships with primarily kids being the ages of 10 to 21 and they referred them back out to us and over the course of two years we worked with roughly about 70 kids on and off and uh, unfortunately for us, um, only, two to ha only two had somewhat promising results. And as we learned by working with them, we learned that, hey, this problem is super deep. And we're gonna get into how deep that problem is. Well, the second part to this, we talked about it really briefly, was location. Where do we go? So the question became for us, when we did these 31 town halls, how did we pick these 31 neighborhoods that we're going into first? And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, has everybody heard the city of Toronto has been broken up into 140 different neighborhoods? So how it got broken up into 140 neighborhoods was a couple of years ago, the city of Toronto did an equity score of the city. And they looked at all these neighborhoods and they wanted to say, well, what is the equitable score? And what that means is they looked at five or six different things. Uh, some of the things had to do with what is the average income of a household in an area? Um, what, or how many of these houses have two parents? What does the community feel like their voice is in the development of their community? and uh, what is the access to economic opportunity? Right, so they looked at a couple of these things and they divvied up the city based on scores. And when they divvied up the bay, city and they based them on scores, they identified 31 neighborhoods as low equitable areas. Right? And, and this neighborhood is one of those 31 neighborhoods. And this is the map of those neighborhoods all over the city. So when we had discovered this, and the, and the good news for this, if there's any good news for this, is that come 2020, the city of Toronto was investing millions of dollars worth of resources and programming to bolster up your neighborhood as well as all these other neighborhoods to an acceptable level. I don't know what that means, but I know it means something. All right, it means something is better than nothing. So with us, we said, all right, let's take a look at this low equity neighborhood. And if you look at the risk factors, one of the first ones was social disorganization. And what that roughly translates to, it's a theory from the 1940s. And what it says is that sometimes environments matter more than the individual person when it comes down to decision making. Sometimes the environmental structure of the community changes things. So that's where we're at. So these 31 low equitable neighborhoods, we did on our own, we looked at the gang activity. We said, okay, well, where do the gangs live? Where are the shootings happening? Where are the gang activities that we know are happening in the city? And if we were to take a look at all that gang data and we looked at all this low equity neighborhoods and we put them on top of each other, it's almost the exact same, which is not a coincidence. All right, the research says this is in fact the connection. All right, the low equity in a neighborhood is one of the many risk factors involved in kids becoming a gang members. So for us, when we had worked with these 70 kids and we realized, hey man, all across the world, there's been nobody that's been able to get a gang member out of a gang with the exception of them being motivated to do it on itself. And with us, out of the 70 kids that we had dealt with, majority of them it was a one-off conversation where we had only had them for half an hour for an hour, we realized, hey man, we, we, we can't do this. this. This doesn't work, it's so intensive. And the two that we had motivated to get out, they did the work on their own, we just bumped them in the right direction, but that was individual relationships. So we decided to do things a little bit differently and get back into the research. And when we got back into the research, we realized very early on that rather than try to get gang members out of gangs, let's find out what's happening with kids all the way from the age of zero 18 to stop them from getting in a gang in the first place and I'll tell you the story which is totally in line with these risk factors of one of the very first kids that we dealt with who hits all of these risk factors and it expands even further and for you here in this room if any part of this story doesn't make sense to you or you say hold on a minute man that's wrong by all means tell me 
And the reason I want to know is because I want to know what's actually happening. I can just tell you this kid's story. <laughs> so these risk factors that you have, there's five categories of them. And the five categories are individual, peer group, school, family, and community. But they don't all happen at the same time. Right? We've got to start with one. And the first category that happens is family. So we get referred to this kid. He was uh, 14 or 15 at the time. And <laughs> what happens is <laughs> sorry, a police officer in a division had arrested this kid, had a relationship with this kid. He participated in one of our educational sessions on these risk factors. Decided, I'm going to try it with this kid. So he tries it with the kid. He said, hey, listen, I know you're kind of a, in a gang. Uh, do you want to get out? I might know people that can help you. This kid said, sure, I'm, I'm open to it. So we got the call. Jason and I went down. We interviewed this kid, and we had, a, we had a conversation with him. And in that conversation, we have a sheet, a risk factor sheet. And literally, it's a checkbox with all these risk factors. And we just gave it to this kid, and we're like, hey, can you fill this out? We'll be back in five minutes. Click what applies to you in your life to the best of your knowledge. So he does it, and there's about 20 or 25 of them. I don't remember. So we come back in, and he's super cooperative. He, he's curious to what's happening, too. And as we have a conversation with him, because he's under the age of 18, we always include the parents. So we incorporate the mom in the conversation somehow. We're talking to the kid and the mom. And with the both of them, we're painting a picture of what happened. So what happened with this kid? And I'll tell you his story. And the research, as well as his story, it's bang on. And he's not the only one. He is one of, again, a multitude of kids that we've dealt with that have showed the same story. And this kid's story starts back at home. And the biggest indicator in the family risk factor category of, of what, what you should be looking out for or what you should be aware of is a three-year-old kid who doesn't listen to anything. All right, I'm, I'm talking about the kid who, who touches the walls and puts his finger in peanut butter. I'm talking about the kid who punches, who kicks, who cries, yells, who takes things from people. I'm talking about this terrible kid. All right, that's who I'm talking about. So with this kid in particular that we're dealing with, in conversation with his mom and his kid, <clears throat> what happens is a mom is, by the time she's 25, she's had five kids. All right, she's a single mom, she's living in community housing, and this kid is the middle kid. So mom says that uh, this kid has been a pain in her butt since the beginning. All right, but he's the middle kid. So for those of us here who've had kids that have been three or currently have kids who are three, I want you to picture this, because this is what mom tells us. Um, uh, when you're at home, and you're washing your dishes, and you can hear your kids playing. Is everything okay? Yeah, you can hear them playing. What happens when you don't hear them? They're up to something, right? So you shut off the water, you shoot, you go there, and you catch them, they're doing something naughty. So this kid's that kid. So every time she's washing the dishes and the water turns off, she, she knows this guy's up to something, and she catches him doing something naughty because he's got those risk factors. It's a middle kid. And what happens is she yells at him, she tells him stop doing it, he stops doing it, but I want you to think about that kid's perspective. All right, what does he really want ultimately? Attention. What happens to a, a newborn baby if they don't get held? They die. Right? They die. That's, they actually die. Well, with this kid here, the subconscious mind in all of us starts to develop uh, an understanding of what's happening around him. And there's actually uh, biologically, physiologically, and through psychology work, we've learned that from the ages of zero to seven, all of our brains. All right, all of our brains operate on what's called a theta wave and it's a state of hypnosis. In that state of hypnosis, what we're doing is we're just gathering information on our subconscious mind. It's not even the mind that knows what's happening. And in that subconscious mind, what we're gathering is what do we need to do to survive, not to succeed? How do I need to operate to survive in the world that I'm in? All right, yes, sir. Is that what it's translating to? You become what you see? You become what you live. Right? So now this kid, he's already developing this firing and wiring, saying, okay, when I do naughty things, I'm getting something innately that I need, which is attention of mom. And for the adults in the room, <clears throat> right before you go to bed and you're frustrated with your life and you're angry at everything, I want you to think back now from zero to seven. Just think back from zero to seven. And think about the behaviors that you learned from zero to seven that you're doing now that maybe you don't like, that maybe your spouse has told you, hey, this, this part of you, I'm not a fan of. It's in all of us. So to think it doesn't affect any of us, you're wrong. It's in all of us. So this kid goes on, right? And the next risk factor category, so group three, he's a pain in the butt. Mom gives him a hard time, but now he's starting to develop an understanding. And all of a sudden he goes to school, and I know we have an academic component here, right? We have some teachers and some academic educators and all that other good stuff. So now the same three-year-old, he's six years old, he's in school, and the biggest indicator in the school environment is when you have a kid in kindergarten who's failing kindergarten. All right, is that normal for anybody here? Is anybody okay with a kid failing kindergarten? 
No, right? So what happens in school? Who's the replacement for mom or dad in school? Teacher. It's a teacher. And I love teachers. All right, I always say I love teachers. Teachers change my life. So I have a very uh, close place for teachers. <clears throat> but this kid goes to school, and as he's in the school, he starts to behave really naughty. And what happens is teachers pull him aside. He gets a special, maybe an EA will help him out, and he gets isolated from everybody, right? And poor teachers, listen, you got to deal with 30 kids or 25 kids. You don't have the time to isolate one kid and deal with this kid who really needs one-on-one -on -one attention, so he gets pushed <coughs> to the side, not to the fault of teachers. All right, but I want you to think what's happening to this kid already. All right, so he's already got this thing, and now what does he realize? The same stuff that he does at home when mom's washing the dishes is the same stuff he's going to do here because he gets that one-on-one. -on -one. And I remember in kindergarten, we had two guys in my class, and they were this kid. And I, I hated them, right? I wanted nothing to do with them. One of the kids used to just take my sandwiches and just punch them, right? Just, I don't know why, but he would just do that stuff. But that's who this kid is. And if you don't know who that kid is, you are probably that kid in kindergarten. All right, but he goes on. So now he's six. He's doing all these naughty things, and he's isolated, and he's failing kindergarten. Here's the crazy thing, right? I know kids don't really fail anymore, all right? But did he succeed? Did he succeed out of kindergarten to grade one? Was he successful, or did he pass? He passed. He's, he's got to make it through, right? So he goes through. So now he's, he's three years old. He's, he's, he's getting naughty stuff at home. Six years old, he's at school. He's failing kindergarten, and then nine years old. All right, nine years old, he's in his peer group. And I want you to think about this, and with this kid in particular that we're dealing with, <clears throat> mom says, you know what? This kid has been a pain in my butt from the age of zero. Now he's nine years old. She lives in community housing. So what does she say to him? She says, you've got too much energy. You need to get out of the house. Who, who said that to their kids here? I, I've said it to my kids, right? I said, you've got too much energy. Get out of here. Give me, give me five minutes of just freedom. Give me five minutes of peace of mind. So the kid, mom says to this kid, the one of five kids, Get out of here, you got too much energy, and it's community housing where she lives. And in community housing, is it not uncommon to see a kid playing outside that age? I've seen five-year-olds playing outside by themselves, right? For me growing up, I just had to be home by the time the street lights went on. Right? So I'd run home after school, I'd drop off my school bag, we'd go play outside. The street lights come on, I gotta go home before I get in trouble. Well, mom kind of makes <laughs> the deal with this kid. But now, I have a nine-year-old, and they can't go anywhere without me hiding in the bushes. All right, like I am so tight to my kid, you, you can't go anywhere. I, I've, I'm overparenting these little guys. But it's the city of Toronto, man. It's not, it's not the same. So this kid's out at nine years old. Now I want you to imagine this, all right? Three years old, pain in the butt. Six years old, failing school, gets isolated all the time, makes no friends. And then nine years old, mom says, get out of here, kid. You got more energy. Now this kid's out playing by himself. Who does he find? Kids like him or kids less like him? Kids like him. Kids like him. So now for the first time, he's found other kids whose moms have also said to him, hey man, you gotta get out of here, you got too much energy. So now for the first time, we have kids in the wild finding other kids in the wild. And now, think about this kid, you're this, you're this nine-year-old kid and you've never fit in anywhere and all of a sudden you find a group of people just like you and you all find each other. And then, <laughs> 15 happens, so nine to 15. And at 15, <coughs> the biggest indicator of a gang member at 15 is self-admission. They tell you I'm a gang member. It's not hard to see. If they have social media, if they have Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, which most kids are on nowadays, they're telling you right on there, I'm a gang member. It's, it's, it's next to impossible not to see. They're, they're advertising it for everybody. This is what I do. And, but this kid in particular from nine to 15, a lot of stuff happened. So we looked at the police records, we spoke to mom, and it all made sense in accordance with the risk factor. So, I'll give you a perspective uh, for us that we've learned on the police end of things and how we can interpret it back. So uh, nine years old when he's first out playing on his own, right? Mom's happy, he's finally got some friends. He's actually excited to wake up. He can't wait to go outside. So mom's like, okay, now this kid's starting to change. He's over this terrible phase. She manages to get him a bicycle. All right, and again, mother of five, single mom, manages to get the one kid a bike. It's a big deal. It's a big deal to that family. So she gives him the bike, he goes out with his friends, he goes to the corner store. Let's just say he goes right here to Driftwood and Driftwood. He runs inside to grab some candy, comes outside, what happens to the bike? The bike's gone, all right? So now he runs home to mom who hustled to get him this bicycle. Now, I want you to say what you would actually say, not what you think is the right thing to say. I'm not gonna arrest you, I don't care. Imagine you do that for your kid and your kid comes home and says, the bike is stolen, what would you say? What would you say? 
I wouldn't even be able to get stolen out of my mouth before my dad would have crushed me, right? My dad would have said, you idiot, you had one job, you had to take care of this bike, you had no idea what I did for you, you know how much, I, this is the problem with you. you, you don't care for anything, you can't even, you're not even responsible, you're an idiot, right? So mom does this to the kid. Eight years old, he just shrinks right down. Well, mom, like all of us, feels bad afterwards. Ah, man, maybe I was too hard on the kid. So she manages to give him another bike. Now, at the age of nine, that bike's stolen again. All right, so now this kid comes back, two stolen bikes. Now, for us on the police side of things, we looked at it, and we have two police records of his bike getting reported stolen. Now, we go in there, and this is the city of Toronto. There's about 400 trillion bicycles in the city of Toronto. Okay, there is no bicycle recovery task force. I hate to tell you that. So while the bike was high value to the family, for us it wasn't of high priority. And the likelihood of us finding your stolen bicycle in the city, unless we find it by accident, is slim to none. I'm just gonna be honest with you. So their relationship with the police is, well, they can't even find my stolen bike, so what else, what can they do? Right, and I get it, I can understand that perspective. So then something happens with this kid and at the age of 11, he goes missing. And when he goes missing, mom calls home and says, uh, calls the police and says, listen, he's supposed to be home by uh, the streetlights. Streetlights have been on for two hours. He's not home. <coughs> we go there. We talk to the mom. The mom says, well, he hangs out with his friends. He's known him since he was nine around the corner. But I got four kids at home. I can't go check. So we go and what do we do? We find the kid there, right? And what happens is when we find those kids like that and they're hanging out with other kids, we got to know the rest of the group that they're hanging around. Not in terms of knowing who their social network is, it's in case this kid goes missing again, we just want to know who his friends are to be able to call them and say, hey, is he at your house? So the police officers go, they find him there, they take him back home, they know his friends. Well, what happens is a year later, now he's 12 years old, he gets reported missing again, and the police officer's going, use that report and find him in the same corner. So, listen, they didn't even go to the house. They found him in that corner with the same group of friends. They took him home and they said, listen, we found him hanging out with his friends. Well, then at 13, he goes missing again, except this time he goes missing for a week. Okay, he's not at the corner. None of his friends are on our of his phone. None of his friends live where they said they live. So now at 13, he comes home, he has a different attitude. And then at 14 and 15, by the time we got to him, he had a serious escalation and now criminal behavior, right? Like serious criminal behavior. We're talking robberies, extortions, weapons offenses, drug offenses, right? And here's the thing, when we go back to that nine-year-old, that nine-year-old, the biggest indicator there, so three is a, a kid who's kind of out of control, like really out of control. Six is a kid who's failing kindergarten. Nine-year-old <coughs> nine is a child delinquency. We took that word from the United States because that's the appropriate word. And what child delinquency is, is this. Uh, who's got, a, who's got a, a 10-year-old here or anybody in that age? You got a 10-year-old? Or even the educator's perfect. So let's say that your 10-year-old comes home from school and says to you, you know, mom or dad, I was at school and uh, uh, Jeff punched me and he took my money from me and he calls me mean names. What do we call that? Bullying. You know what that's called if you're over the age of 12? That's extortion and robbery. So what delinquency means is children committing criminal acts. We just don't call it crime. We call it delinquency. So that's an indicator. They're practicing what's going to be, they're showing you this is what I'm going to do. I'm doing it now. This is not a question of if, it's a question of when because it's happening right now. But what happens is we just kind of tolerate it, right? What do we say? Something like, boys will be boys. You know, oh, you shouldn't go online then. We use these simple solutions to, to bigger problems, right? We're, we're kind of stuck with that. But now this kid becomes 15. He's a self-admitted gang member. He's got the history to prove it. Everything's saying this. Well, with this kid in particular, we kind of lost this kid. All right, he's not dead yet. Um, <coughs> the likelihood of him ending up like that is potentially high. He just wanted to discontinue communication with us. So on a whim, we end up talking to his mom, and when we talk to his mom, uh, we realized something else, which took us to a deeper perspective. So again, we started off saying, how do we get a gang member out of a gang, trying it, not working? Then we said, okay, well, what can we do to find out how we can stop kids from the age of zero and 18 to get into a gang? And we kind of had some success with it because now we became way more educated on the what to look out for and when, and then we developed some partnerships. <coughs> and then when we talked to the mom, things changed again. And when we talked to the mom, this is what happens. We said to her, hey, listen, where's your boy? Like, we, we haven't, he's not answering his phone calls. We haven't seen him. He doesn't want to talk to us. What happened? She goes, I don't know. It's like he's just become a different kid. I can't even control him. So we decided on a whim. We said to the mom, well, let's see what your risk factors are. And the mom's risk factors were more than her kid. 
which was a big thing for us. It was like a light bulb. We said, well, what's happening here? The question became, well, why did you not become a gang member, but your kid did? And there's a couple reasons. One is she had something called protective factors. So she had things in her life while she had high risk for many other things. She either had parents, teachers, role models, a friend, somebody who helped keep her on track a little bit that this kid didn't have. But that also painted a different picture. So I'll ask here, anybody uh, who here is a, a new immigrant to the country? Anybody here born outside of Toronto? Or sorry, born outside of Canada? <laughs> right? <laughs> and how old were you when you came into Canada? Five. Five years old. <coughs> and when you came in with your parents? Yeah. Where did your parents come from? India. India. And when they came from India, um, what did they tell you about India? About India? Yeah. It's a good place, right? Yeah. And when they came to Canada, did they know the did they know the language? Yeah. They did? Oh, they're educated, man. You're lucky. All right. My parents, when they immigrated here, they didn't know the language. And uh, I remember when I was younger, the amount of racism that was like blatant in their face. There was no hidden racism like it is now. All right. It's, uh, that's the crazy part of a racism. It's, it's not the way it was. It was really bad when my parents first came to Canada. And I saw a lot of it growing up, and I went through it growing up, but it's, it's, it's not the same as it is now. It was, it was right in your face. And, uh, and I look at how tough they had it. And then one day I came into the office, and uh, Jason bought me a coffee, and I like cream in my coffee, and there was milk. And I drank it, and I'm like, oh, my day sucks. <laughs> all right? I got the wrong lactose in my coffee. All right? I, I didn't get the right. I got cream over milk, and my day was kind of ruined. And I thought for a minute, what would my dad have said if I called him and said, Dad, my, my day's ruined because I got cream instead of milk. He would have hung up the phone and would probably slap me the next time he sees me. It's like, this is what you're complaining about? And the reason I bring that up is for all of us, I want you to think of your parents. Whenever we think our life is hard, well, think about your parents, right? Think about what they went through. And then on top of it, if you have kids, <laughs> look at their life. I complain my kids are spoiled, but I'm the one spoiling them. Right? And I said, go. And I, I give them the same lecture my parents gave me. I said, you have no idea how much I had to hustle to get here, and you don't even appreciate this garbage. And that same story is happening to this family. The point is, it's supposed to get better. So while this mom had more risk factors, her kid had less, she's doing the best that she could do, given the situation that she's in. So we started to realize earlier on that, hey, listen, if we want to really attack this problem, we need to strengthen the family environment. And how do you strengthen the family environment is to find who the pillars are in that home. Jason and I, we can't help that kid anymore. We, we tried. It's not going to happen. We're, we're done with it. We just, we can't do it. He doesn't want to do it. And that's, it's all voluntary for us. <clears throat> but there's four other kids in that household. One of the risk factors is a family that's involved in a gang, family member. Well, if we can strengthen that mom in that household, we've greatly reduced the likelihood of the four other kids following that same path, as well as probably increased mom being a protective factor to her son. And when we spoke to the mom and said, what help do you want? And all the mothers and fathers that we spoke with now, they're so receptive to help because for the first time, somebody asked them, what do you need? We've always focused on young kids. Kids don't even know what, what, what they're doing. They have no idea what's happening. And I understand the idea of, of taking into the, the voice of the youth. I get it. But that's, there's, a, there's a whole road of inexperience there, and there still needs to be a pillar of guidance at the home. So with us, it became, how do we focus on the families? And... That became even more clear where in one of our town halls, we had a, a survivor of uh, human trafficking, and we had an ex-gang leader in one of our town halls. And we asked them both, and when we had our open conversation, we said, well, <clears throat> what happened for you to get into this lifestyle? What happened for you to get out? <clears throat> and this is, the, this is the part of the importance of the family environment and the family household was, in both of their situations, a broken home is what got them into the life of crime. The gang member became a gang member because his home was broken ultimately. The sex trafficking survivor got involved in that trade, got manipulated because she came from a broken home. And what got them out of it was the family environment. The sex trafficking survivor had a child and understood what family meant for her. And she said, I'm not doing this to myself anymore. And she got out because she now had a family. And the gang leader, not even a gang member, a gang leader found a girlfriend that he fell in love with. And he got out. So when we look at things, if you will, when we look at the importance of family, when it comes down to gangs, gang prevention, to not just gangs and gang stuff, it's, it's number one. If you look at the risk factors, where does family come into play? Zero to seven. When you have kids operating at that theta wave, the state of hypnosis, and you want to talk about influencing behavior, they're wired to be influenced. 
So for us to get the most bang for our buck, it's getting in as soon as we can. But that paints something else. So this kid, 15, we lose him. 18, the biggest indicator now of the community risk factors is when we see what we have happening now. Shootings every day, homicides happening to any and everybody, innocent people being shot and killed, which it's a reality. I think one of our last homicides was an, a completely innocent person right here in Rexdale, completely innocent. And he is not the first this year. It's just random people because of where they are being targeted by violent gang members who are just shooting people for the sake of shooting people. And that can't be tolerated at any level. But now we have serious violent crime and delinquency in the community. And what happens is we get to this point here where there's a lot of pressure. It's a ton of pressure and a ton of stress more importantly. And at this stage here, what happens? What do you read in the newspaper? Homicide, shootings, guns, gangs. And then everybody says what? Everybody says somebody has to do something about this. Everybody. I'm not talking the community. I'm talking to even us. Everybody says somebody has to do something about it. And who's that somebody? It's the police. Right? And we take that very seriously, and we feel a very strong commitment to want to do stuff. And that forces the evolution of policing for us now looking at things a little bit differently to say, where can we improve? Where can we do things better? Where should we invest in partnerships and figuring things out? And that's kind of how we ended up here. But it goes a little deeper than that, just slightly deeper than that. With us, when we looked for how do we attack this model, this is exactly all the risk factor categories. We learned early on we adopted a model from the United States that is the gold standard for how do you prevent gangs from happening? How do you prevent gang crime from happening? How do we maximize success for everybody involved while minimizing victimization? And what we have is in Toronto, we have this, this gold model standard, but we broke it down to four pillars. Right? And these four pillars are very important to us. So number one is education. It's doing what we're doing now. It's taking everything that we've learned, staying up to date on a weekly basis to what's happening in the world on every aspect of this, sharing the information with people. And the second part of that is hearing back from communities like this say, well, what's actually happening here? That's an education portion for us, so that when we can go back to our senior officers, to the police services board, to the mayor, we can say, hey, in the Driftwood community, this is what the perspective is. Or one of the biggest problems that we've seen historically across the board is cities in every place in the United States, in Canada and UK, they will find one strategy and say, we're gonna do this everywhere. But is Driftwood the same as Chalk Farm? Is Chalk Farm the same as Flemington? Is Flemington the same as Flamborough? or Galloway. No, they're not. They're all different, so this is not going to work. So we need to know what's happening in each individual community. But the other three pillars for us is prevention, intervention, and suppression. Now, historically and statistically, prevention works between these three risk factor categories. Between the ages of zero to nine is really where you want the prevention. If we've waited until they're 18 years old, we've waited too long. Now you're dealing with a whole different beast. So for us, when we looked at all the prevention strategies that actually work, that have been evaluated by a third party, they've all said this is the best time to come into play, all right, between the ages of zero to nine, that's prevention. And while our name of our unit is Gang Prevention Task Force, the part for us that's possibly more important on the law enforcement end and the jail end and the corrections end is this part, the intervention part. All right, and what the intervention part is this, let's say we prevent all these kids from getting in gangs now, all right? What happens to the tens of thousands of kids, children, or young adults that are currently involved in the criminal justice system. If you're part of a gang, you're almost at 70% more likely to reoffend than anybody else. So they're at a higher rate to reoffend, and they're just sitting in that intervention pocket. So they're still going to come out gang members. We arrest them, they go in gang members, they get out, they get their gang members. But we have a unique opportunity when we have them in jails, because now they have structure. And with structure, we can intervene and we can create some different pipelines and some different blueprints to get them out. And for us, where the police lay and where our importance is in this is suppression, which is enforcement. The number one way to combat gang violence all across the world, the number one way is to arrest the people committing the violent acts. There's no, there's no questions about it. The people who are going out into these neighborhoods and shooting innocent people, killing innocent people, the ones that are manipulating young girls into getting involved in sex trafficking, the ones who are trafficking in drugs where people are overdosing on drugs laced with fentanyl and dying and destroying families, they have to be held accountable for what they do. 150%, right? But that's not everybody. And I'll explain where that comes into. With us, when it comes down to who do we focus on, it's a focused suppression, it's a focused enforcement. There was a study done <coughs> of a gang in Los Angeles, 300 gang members. 
And what they realized after the study, they realized that 10% of this gang was responsible for 100% of the criminal decision making. 30 people out of 300 were responsible for all of the crime and criminal decision making. The other 270 gang members had an average gang membership span of two years. They weren't a gang member for life, 10% were. The other 270 gang members, or 90% of them, the reason they got out of the gang was all because of them figuring out stuff on their own. They either got into school, they found a girlfriend or boyfriend, they physically moved, they got a job, they were the victim of a gang crime, they had a friend who was a victim of a crime, and they said, this life isn't for me, and they left. Our goal as law enforcement is to identify who that 90% is so that we don't bring them into the intervention street, that we can focus on addressing their risk factors to say, hey man, we don't want you in this system. You're gonna get out, how can we shrink that two years to a year? How can we shrink that year to six months? How can we make it so we never have to arrest you? And by figuring out who that 90% are, we can focus all our efforts on that 10%, the one who are killing people, trafficking in women, dealing in drugs, stealing cars, breaking into homes, terrorizing communities, having people live in fear. And that's our goal, and we never shy from that. It's so important to remember that while we're looking at kids and that story I told you about that 15-year-old kid who's, it's a sad story and he's one of thousands in this city, the other half to that is who's on the receiving end of that when he pulls the trigger? What about that family? You know, we've done, uh, I think, uh, Jay, is this our 14th town hall? 13th. 13th town hall, 13 <laughs> town halls. And I think yesterday was our seventh where we had a mother who lost a kid who was shot and killed. It was our seventh mom in 13 <clears throat> town halls. And when that happened in the room, the room changed because everybody yeah. felt so sympathetic towards these kids that end up as gang members, these kids that pull the trigger and these kids that live a horrible life. But when you remember what the 10% are doing, it, it has to put you in balance. And this is the most difficult part about this whole thing is we need to stay objective and balanced. You can buy into any one of these, but to truly solve the problem, we need to buy into all four of them. Education, prevention, intervention, and suppression. With us, the gold model we took from the United States is based off of these five core strategies, all right? And, and while we have those four pillars, they all rest on top of a bed, and that bed is this. Community mobilization, it's getting into communities and finding who the community leaders are. Part of us coming in here was we wanted to see who's gonna come out, who are the community champions. As law enforcement, we're not unaware that the biggest issue we have with communities is distrust. Nobody ever calls the police because they have extra birthday cake at home. All right, so there's already a negative connotation when police show up. One, we carry guns. Two, we have a vest. Three, we're extremely good looking, so it makes people feel intimidated. <laughs> I get it. Listen, we're not stupid about that. But for us to effectively do this, why would we spend 90% of our time trying to create a relationship when you already have trust and influence in your communities? Where can we find the community champions? And for us, by doing this, we're finding community champions that we can invest into, whether it be through courses, through training, through actual monetary investment for programming. We need to find people who actually have the trust and who understand the vision and who don't have the ego about it. Right? And that for us is a massive part of it. Opportunities provision is this. For the uh, academics in the room or the educators, <coughs> the kids that you have that fit this bill, do they have difficulty uh, adopting <coughs> to traditional education standards? It's difficult for them to adopt to that environment. But are they dumb? Not at all. So part of this for us as well is identifying different opportunities and promoting organizational change and development within not just the police, but every organization that we deal with. Say, so how do we work around this? How do we adjust to this? You, you can't force everybody by adopting by that. That 10% are extremely disruptive probably to the school environment. They're extremely disruptive to everybody else in there. So we have to make some effort to reduce the disruption to maximize their success, their success and really look at some opportunities one of the communities <coughs> I had worked in depth with uh, about two years ago, um, it was a bunch of moms in a really gang-impacted community. Uh, there were a lot of murders there. And the moms kept saying in every meeting we had with them, we just want to get our kids jobs and trades. All right, they pay well, they're good to work with their hands. And, uh, and we're like, oh, okay. So we kind of figured it out a little bit. And then we had a conversation with one of the kids, and they don't want to do that. They don't want to do it. So you can't think that as a mom or a dad, well, this is what my kid needs to do. It doesn't work that way. You gotta find out what they wanna do and you gotta promote it. So it's, it's connecting to the opportunities and saying, well, how do we incorporate into there? 
right? One of the things that we use in the examples are is um, in this neighborhood here, for example, and it's, it's the easiest example for me to use, so I use it all the time, is is there a Starbucks here? <coughs> is there a Starbucks anywhere here? Yeah, it's far, why is there no Starbucks here? What else? What else? What else isn't there here? Tell me. Why isn't it here? So we tell our kids what? What do we tell kids? You can do anything you want in the world, right? You could be, listen, I'm going to tell you what my parents said because I'm sure some parents here and some kids here were told the same thing. These are my five options in life, all right? Doctor, lawyer, engineer, um, police officer, or failure. Okay, these, these are your options. You better hit one, one of these four, kid, or else you're number five. So add one more. Scientist. I w listen, if, my, if, if I had known I had other options in life from a young age, I probably wouldn't have been a cop. I probably would have been a model. But <laughs> it's too late for me. So I'm married. It's too late for me. But here's the thing. that The point is of that is about really being aware of different opportunities and, and opening up minds. Um, the social intervention piece is a massive part because socially we need to start to change on how we operate. All of us. We need to really get back up to speed. You know, I catch myself doing it too. Because we deal with teenagers all the time, I'm in high schools, uh, coming in the new year quite a bit. In the last year, I've been high schools a, a couple times. Is um, you got to kind of adopt with the times, all right? And it's not saying that you need to start dressing like him or talking like him. You just got to understand that it's not you and it's, it's them, right? And that's called a social intervention. And that's how you get over yourself and start to have some real influence. And suppression, suppression is number one for us, is again, that 10%, you can't negate that. You can never just be okay with that. That can't be tolerated at any level. The other part of the American model, and this is the one that we really like, I want you to think about that kid of zero to 18, zero to 18, zero to 18. How many organizations, government agencies, places did that person impact or come across? Families at home, right? And where do those families live? Everywhere, where in particular? Community housing, right? So community housing is everywhere as well. But community housing is impacted in this particular scenario. All right, community housing is impacted, and then this kid goes where? Where, do, where does he not pass? Or where does he not be successful? School? Schools are impacted, all right? And after school, when this kid's out playing at a park, city's impacted, community's impacted, parks are impacted. Rec programs are impacted. Some of these kids are in social programs and places like this, they're impacted. All right, as we get older, these kids impact a lot of different people and a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of different organizations. If we've waited until it's 18, it's too late. It's a police problem now and we have to do what we do. And it's at this stage here where things are like, well, why can't we do other things? We're waiting way too long to really get to the root of this. And the reason why we identify these stakeholders is saying our goal at the end of this is to have all of these stakeholder groups together. And when you see Integrated Gang Prevention Task Force, the idea is for the Toronto Police logo to be one of many logos on that task force. That's what the idea is, is we wanna have both the school boards on here. We wanna have Toronto Community Housing on here. We want the City of Toronto on here. We want all of us who are all impacted at the same time to be on the same page and have the same language. So that as we're talking to each other, we can understand where is the best person suited for the best time period of this person's life. Zero to seven, you don't want a police officer there. We, we don't, that, we're not designed for that. I never went to school for ECE. I don't, I don't have any idea. I, got, I went to school to become a police officer. I went to school to arrest people. That's what I went to school for. So that's where we should be. But we shouldn't be necessarily in there between zero to seven. There's probably better people to put in there that are already doing good work. We just need to find them. Once they're in school environments, what type of supports the teachers need? And there's probably better people to support you than a police officer or community housing or a, a lawyer. We're going to have to start to get really creative. So the idea is to incorporate as many stakeholders as we have. The model says these are the ones you need to get together with first. Schools, service providers, law enforcement, criminal justice entities, municipal and provincial and federal levels of government. All right, that's what this model says. I'll, I'll, but we took it a step further. The reason we took it a step further was we said we're going to expand on this model. And these are the people we spoke to over the last three years. The Toronto Police Service, City of Toronto, Ministry of Attorney General being all our court system, our lawyers, our prosecutions, children and youth services, our jails, our detention centers, 
both the school board, Safe and Caring Schools Toronto, uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, because mental health trauma is massive in gang kids and their families, victim and witness protection for all the victims of gang crime, churches and religious organizations, religious institutions, employment programs and community residents, businesses, hospitals, and media. These are all the people that we just said right off of the bat, we're gonna, and this is growing. Uh, just a uh, th uh, month ago, we connected with um, Kids Help Phone. Um, we connected with uh, Children's Aid, both Catholic and public, and it's starting to grow. And the reason why it's going is because we're starting to pitch this idea of, hey, listen, all of us are impacted. We're all suffering from this. We have to come together and remove our ego. We have The reason why this American model has never been successfully implemented anywhere is because of ego. Ego among organizations, ego among people. People want to know, what does this cost me? What do I get out of it? So we have to get over the ego of that. If you notice with this, um, no offense to anybody, but there's a reason why we didn't put politicians on here. Right, we're not into that. I'm not into that business. I don't, I don't care for that. It's a different ball game for me. I don't understand it. I don't want to understand it, but we need people who are going to be there for a long time. The other reason why we don't put political people on here is because they change. And what happens when politics change? Right? Funding changes, ideas changes, people championing things change because there's always a better way to do it. Um, those are our pillars. We just call it EPIS because it's education, prevention, intervention, and suppression. And to close off, um, the reason I bring up the initiative or the Starbucks idea was this. When we talk about real opportunity, all right, and, and you have kids here and we're all impacted and we all have kids and we always say things to them like, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be an astronaut, you can be a millionaire, whatever you want to tell your kids. The reality is a lot of kids in these neighborhoods, in our neighborhoods, have no idea what's a block away. They live in a, in a block of a city. And I want you to imagine when I say to you there's no And the reason I chose Starbucks was Starbucks is actually an amazing company to work for. They pay for education, they pay well, they have a corporate structure, they're global, and you can actually move up in that company. So if there's not even a Starbucks here to show to a young kid when you can say you can be anything, and they have not seen anything past the city block, what's the reality of that to them? We understand what the reality of is because we're adults and we have experience, but we have to look at exposure. Uh, one of the gang kids that uh, kind of got referred to us And this kid went on a trip to I think. It was just two hours north of here, and it's a beautiful part of the city, or sorry, part of the province. And he came back, and for the first time, this kid who's been edged in gangs his whole life said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Because he saw something different. He experienced two hours away from his neighborhood. Two hours changed this kid's life. All right now, for us, it's really being cognizant of what we're going to preach, how we're going to preach it, what can we do, and how do we start exposing things a little bit differently. So. Um, that being said, thank you for hanging with me for that 40 minute or whatever it was, little pitch. What we're going to do now is I'm going to turn off the microphone and the camera, um, <laughs> grab a coffee, um, we'll set up the chairs in a circle if you don't mind helping me, and then we'll get to the real conversation. Now here's the part about the real conversation. We promise everybody here a level of anonymity. All right, that being said, is as long as you haven't seen a murder, we can work with you. We hope that everybody here can appreciate that. And when we really want people to be open and honest about their experiences, but what's happening here. And now we don't want to know, oh, house number 17 is dealing drugs. We don't want to know that. What we want to know is, hey, when I wake up, like I'm terrified to go outside because there's been shootings there. You know, some of the feedback we got from communities just to give you some insight of really what's been helpful for us in looking at things is, uh, I'll give you two quick examples or three quick ones. Uh, one is, one community member had said, when it came down to social services, they're not underserviced, they're poorly serviced. And that was a great takeaway for us. The other one was uh, that the levels of distrust start at home. So that came from a mother who lost her kid and uh, her friend was actually there, not her. And initially for us as police officers, when there's a murder, we knock on everybody's door. We wanna know what happens. And uh, <laughs> this person, and when, and when people don't tell us what happens is we victimize ourselves. And we said, we can't even do our job because nobody's telling us what's happening. Well, this person painted a different light saying, well, there's a, a mother to a murdered child, lives in a neighborhood where people know who killed their kid and they're not even telling her. So the distrust starts right at home.
So for us, it helps us change our perspective to understand that we're on 100% of the distrust. And why that's so beneficial to us as law enforcement is I want you to picture this. Um, uh, what's your name, sir? And uh, your name? If I said, hey, listen, I want you to have a relationship with, I want you to be friends with him. By the way, he hates everybody. 100% of his hate is towards how motivated would you want to be to try to work out a relationship with this guy? Zip. Zip. Well, for us, we had that same mentality saying that we think we're 100% of the distrust. By understanding we're not 100% of the distrust, that the distrust starts right at home from the moment they wake up to every interaction, it makes it a much easier number to work with mentally. Um, and then <laughs> the last one that I wanted to bring up was the services one. We talked about the, the, the mother and the distrust. And um, uh, there, there was another one, which I forget. There's so many of them. Oh, yesterday we had one, actually. And this was a, one that's been a common theme. And I think it got brought up before as well, but we had a kid who had said that he feels like everything is so normalized now when it comes down to violence in his community. So he actually said, he caught it yesterday and he said, you know, I was walking home and there's a crime scene. It was another one where I live. And he was like, I was more upset that I had to walk around the crime scene to get home than I was that there was a crime scene. And then, you know, parents that said they live in fear, they don't come out of that. That's the type of stuff that we, we really need to know what's happening here to be able to appropriately recommend things implement things and, and figure out what's happening here. So well, let's take five minutes, there's some more Timbits, some samosas, uh, and then we'll just rearrange the chairs and we'll go from there. Is that cool? Thanks everybody, thank you.